investigation, the hazing thing, and that uh, what the victims were saying, and that is that they had been subject to um, um, uh, rough housing, harassment, um, physical assaults all season, but it had happened down there at the school. So they may want to look into that. Sure. And uh, so um, uh, it was while we were having that conversation, actually, that uh, Ms. Schultz called. And uh, that day we faxed her our paperwork. I mean, we immediately started getting our paperwork together. We shared our case file with her up to that point. I told her everything I knew about the case. Uh, she told me that uh, Rachel Priest would be calling me, or for me to call Rachel Priest. That's what she told me to call Rachel Priest, which I did. I, I called her, and after we played phone tag a few times, we, I got in touch with her. Um, did DCS ever dispatch anybody to work with you? Not that I recall, no. Okay. No. So now I went with Ms. Schultz. I allowed her to go with me when I interviewed that last juvenile uh, several weeks after the event had occurred. She asked if she could go along and sit in on the interview, and I was fine with it. I mean, yeah. But not during your initial set of interviews? No. No, no and, uh, you know, when you get DCS involved, I mean, and the, they do a very good job. A lot of them do a very good job, but, you know, uh, but I've had instances in which DCS <coughs> were doing a parallel investigation, and it's torpedoed my investigation, you know. I mean, they've talked to witnesses and shared information that I didn't want shared, and uh, in one case, they told a suspect that they had been cleared, and they didn't have to take polygraph, and uh, so, you know, I mean, we can get into a lot of stories like this, and, well, but. Tell me this, then. based on your experience and your investigation, your, did your thought process follow this? The child was safe. Yes. He wasn't in danger. No. He's been treated for his injuries. An adult wasn't a perpetrator. No. He wasn't going to be exposed to the alleged perpetrators. No. There wasn't a forensic interview. No, I mean, he's in the hospital bed. Okay. Yeah. And two, the quicker that on any, any crime against person, any crime basically, but especially crime against person, the quicker you work it and interview your witnesses while everybody's memory's fresh and before everybody talks to each other and their point of view gets contaminated, you need to move fast on it. And that's what I tried to do in this case. Um, you know, I give up my Christmas Eve off, my vacation. I give up half a day on Christmas with my family. I was off that weekend. I went and worked that weekend on this case. You know, I, I did all that to try to make sure that I did everything that I needed to do to get the correct information and to quickly be able to ascertain the facts on it. And by my count, you went from December 22nd until the 29th or 30th, and they were charged as a week. Yes. That's a pretty quick investigation. Well, we actually, I actually obtained the, the petitions on them on Christmas Eve on the suspects. But the... Um, so there was no delay? No, on, the, on the, the major charges, the aggravated rape and aggravated um, assault against the three suspects on the one main victim, the one victim that was injured, victim number one. I obtained those petitions on Friday, Christmas Eve. Um, it was, and we had a, a conversation with the DA, the assistant DA, uh, Strassenvogel, and uh, with uh, Sarah Reynolds, the Sevier County Juvenile Court Officer, who, you know, has to get, run it by the judge before these felony petitions are signed off on. And all of this had to be done. I mean, this is another procedure. You have to get everybody together, call in a judge on a holiday and <coughs> get him on the phone and all this stuff. So, anyway, all this was approved, but they decided that it would be in the best interest from a logistics standpoint, too, and for my investigation, too, to wait till Monday to serve the petitions. I completely understand that. Now, his, uh, now the, the victim's mom, they were upset. You know, they want to put in jail right then. But, you know, I really didn't have, I mean, and it was a good thing I didn't because it came up that there was other victims. And, uh, you know, when you start putting people in jail, all the kids are going to shut down, nobody's going to talk. And we thought that it would be better to wait until Monday to serve the petitions. So help me with the timeline now so I can make sure that I'm clear with the court. Mm -hmm. Late evening hours of December 22nd, the incident occurs. Yes. You're responding we early morning hours of the 23rd. I got the call at 1220. I don't know what time it came in the police department, probably within 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the 23rd? Yes. Shortly after midnight on 23rd. 24 hours later, 
Do you obtain petitions from the juvenile court of Sevier County? Yes. Where the incident occurred? Yes. Where all the perpetrators were? Do what? Where the perpetrators were at the time that the incident occurred? In Sevier County, yes, sir. Where the victim was? Yes, sir. At the time the incident occurred? Yes, sir. All within 24 hours. Right, the 23rd of your involvement to Christmas Eve, the 24th. Yes, sir. You got a petition before the court? Yes. Was any of this at, at the player's home? Did this occur in the player's home? No. Okay. Yeah, it occurred at a rental cabin in Sphere County. Okay. Now, the allegations of previous assault prior to the incident were allegedly happened at Ulawa High School and uh, in a locker room and in the study hall. Okay. Uh, now, tell me this. <coughs> Did any player tell you that Coach Montgomery, Coach Williams, athletic director Nate Lee or any school administrator knew of the conduct of the election? They were adamant. The victim number one, I asked him, I said, he told me that he knew that they were going to do this to him because um, they had done the other freshman this way. They got through in a hot tub and that uh, he had saw him do this to the other freshman. And I said, well, why didn't you tell the coach? And I, had, he, I asked him, I said, did the coach know? No. Why didn't you tell the coach? I just didn't. Did the other players that you interviewed, the other 11, they said the same thing? Yes. Nobody, and I asked them twice. I asked them, I went back, and um, I believe that my recordings of this will support what I'm saying. But I know that I asked each one of them twice to make sure that the coach didn't know. The assistant coach didn't know. The athletic director, nobody told anybody what even his own son didn't tell. I, I mean. Would it surprise you if weeks later, Suddenly now, players have a different recollection. Yes, and that's that was what I run into. I mean, one of the uh, mothers of one of the kids said that uh, they had told somebody, but that mother wasn't very credible. The more I talked to that mother, the less credibility I, she sent me on a wild goose chase about a video. Uh, she spoke for to the media, saying that she was speaking for the mother of the main victim. And that lady, the, the mother of the main victim, got very angry with me, you know, with all the media coverage. She said, we didn't want this. We don't want this. I mean, you're victimizing him all over again. Um, and I can say, and she said, that woman does not speak for me. Can you tell me why you didn't charge Coach Montgomery? Coach with Williams? what? What should I charge him with? I mean, he did nothing wrong. In my opinion, he did nothing wrong. I thought he set a good example for the young man. I mean, he told the truth and didn't try to cover anything up. Did you tell the court what your conclusions were from your investigation about this incident? My investigation was that you had three young men that had been done, treated in a similar fashion in a hazing incident in which they were not injured. This young man had on a thin pair of knit sweatpants that were pretty well wore and a very thin pair of underwear. Um, it poked through his clothing where it didn't poke through the other ones and he was injured. Um, based on the statement made uh, by my last witness who was in the room that he said the whole thing from the time they were holding him down and pushing the whole thing lasted about 20 to 30 seconds and as soon as it busted through and went inside of him, they said, oh, the main one said, oh, beep, dropped the pool stick, and they left. There was no, you know, rape, torture. There was no screams of anguish. He said that uh, the young man fell down on the floor, said, oh, oh, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. And he told him to go get Coach T. And he said he went upstairs and got Coach T. But even then, they didn't tell the coach what had happened. And the other thing, too, all this about the pool <coughs> stick, you know, the tip of the pool stick, you know, uh, I was told that that's what the UT surgeons had recovered and that's what I needed to go get. I went and got that, put it in evidence, put it, locked it up in my office. I looked at it several days after we had uh, uh, did our arraignments 
And it's not a piece of the pool stick. It's a piece of his clothing. It's a piece of fabric from his sweatpants. That's what that was that they removed from him. So, I mean, what this case actually is, is much smaller than what it's been blown up to be. Detective Burns, let me ask you this. In your experience in investigating cases like this, did Mr. Montgomery willfully fail to do anything? Not to my that? knowledge, no. Did Coach Williams fail to do anything? Not to my knowledge, no. About Mr. Hayden? Not to my knowledge, no. Last words, but I promise. Um, Coach Williams helped you in every way he could. Didn't yes, sir. You? Coach Williams never tried to hide anything, as far as you know, did he? No, sir. Completely forthright and forthcoming at the hospital, is that right? Yes, he had less knowledge than what Coach Montgomery, but Coach Montgomery went and attended to the young man. I mean, Coach Williams wasn't as involved in the situation. Was your understanding that the uh, when this incident occurred, Coach Williams was actually upstairs punishing another player for using bad language? I had heard something to that effect that they had done, that he had made him run up a, um, I know that he administered some this. discipline. Yeah, I think he made him run up down a slope out there on the hill for doing something. I don't recall now what it was, but that came to my attention when interviewing some of the players. That because he had heard him using bad language? I, I don't remember what it was for, sir. No. So your, your investigation uncovered no proof that any of these gentlemen to my left knew of any prior incidents with this player? No, as a matter of fact, Mr. Naley told me, he said, um, he said um, and my investigation revealed no prior um, juvenile records on any of the three suspects involved. Uh, Mr. Naley told me, he said, these are not three kids that we see in our office. He said, these, you know, we've not had trouble with these kids in the past. And there's been much made in the media statement was made that this young man was covered with feces and blood. That is absolutely false from what I've found out in my investigation. A lot of the things that came through the media, I don't even think came from the family. They were just people that called, called stuff into the media. But that's an absolutely false statement. As far as I know, yes. yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, uh, I'm somewhat confused, but hopefully I'll, I'll get on the right path. Um, you said people had to run up hills for using bad language. Is that what One of the players had told me that, that, uh, and I don't know if this was that day, that evening, or some prior, and I didn't say they had to run up the hills because they used bad language. All I'm saying is that one of the players told me that Coach Williams had disciplined a couple of them for whatever incident that they had, whatever violation, and I think it was prior to this, and he had made them run, is what I understood, like run up a slope. All right, uh, your investigation before, we're talking about the December incident, what, what did you learn about the, the tradition or the, the hazing, as you referred to a moment ago in direct examination, that occurred at the high school in regard to the basketball team? I don't quite understand your question. Come again. The players indicated to you that they're, they knew they were gonna get hazed and beat up, things of that nature, correct? Yes. All right. What did they tell you about that tradition? Well, first of all, I asked them, I said, were there any cuts or bruises for what happened down there in Uwawa? Well, no. Did you really get hurt? No. Were they really hitting you hard? Well, they were hitting us, but not as hard as they could. Okay. You seem to be minimizing all this. No, no, reason. I'm just telling the truth, sir. I'm, I'm just, just telling the truth, you. okay? That's okay. what that's what we're here about today is the truth. No more argumentative than the hour-long cross-examinations we've had to endure, Judge? They also told me the senior on the team, who was the main violator, had told me that uh, he had been victimized himself in this way when, uh, I think he told me it was when they went to Hilton Head. And I questioned him, I said, so, I said, I, I, said, I made some inquiry about a pool table. He said, well, this happened over in Hilton Head. And the way he talked, I mean, it was a tradition for the uh, freshman to be hazed, for lack of a better word, bullied, whatever whatever term you want to use, sir. So the main suspect talked about when he was a freshman, this same behavior was 
perpetrated upon him. That's what he said, yes, but I don't know if that was true or if he was just trying to minimize, you know, his involvement or to so, excuse his involvement, so but he did say that. The main suspects indicate, indicates to you when he was a freshman at Ultawa, he was violated with a pool stick. And he didn't him. say that he was, he said they did the same thing to me is what he said. Now we would, if, you know, okay. if we, if we could play my recording, we would have exactly what was said. My computer last night, I couldn't get it to work. I tried to go back, so I'm testifying from memory. But there was a, uh, there was an incident in which he said that the same thing, if I'm recalling correctly, that this kind of thing had happened to him. And what did you take the same thing as? That uh, someone had stuck a pool stick up against his rear end, too, on the outside of his clothing. Okay. And so that had happened some four years earlier? If he's telling the truth, yes. Okay. All right. And so uh, these freshmen become, uh, I guess, are aware this is going to happen to them? Yes. All right. What happened to, what did they say happened to Nortua? They said that um, uh, in the locker room, uh, Sometimes they would turn out the lights, and uh, it was mainly the suspect number one that was the main marine leader in this. But uh, that this had happened once or twice in Ulawa, where in the locker room uh, they had to be beat in on the team. In other words, being freshmen, and they would turn off the lights and they would run in and start punching them. And uh, uh, then he said uh, the main victim told me up in study hall one day that. Uh, the main suspect, the one that had the pool stick, had uh, started hitting him and said he had gotten mad and he had struck him back. And, you know, he said, what are you doing? You know, you're not supposed to, and I'm paraphrasing all this, but he had uh, been shocked that he had retaliated against him because he's supposed to take it, he's a freshman, you know. And he said that uh, the, uh, the main ringleader kind of had a problem with him after that because he stood up to him. When was that in relationship to the December incident? I don't remember. It was sometime previous to that. But now, the three suspects didn't come on the basketball team after football season ended. So it would have been sometime between the time they come to Gatlinburg and when they came on the team after the football season ended. Did the three main suspects exhibit this type of behavior to the football team as well? Not to my knowledge. I didn't question about anything like that. All right. <clears throat> So there's this uh, history or tradition, whatever you want to call it, of hazing or beating into a team. That was what uh, that was what was told to me by the uh, suspects. By the suspects, not just. Well, the victim said that they had experienced it themselves, you know, that year. But the victim said it really didn't start till the three boys came off the football team. But nonetheless, the suspects and the victims all talked to you about this. Hazing or beating in or whatever, whatever, however we want to characterize that. Yes, sir, they did, yes. Right. Now, are, are you aware of the Tennessee law about mandatory reporting abuse or sexual abuse? Yes. All right. Uh, you didn't report this, did you? It didn't fall within the parameters of what we report. I mean, this was um, a kid-on-kid -kid assault. I mean, it wasn't really sexual in nature. I did try to see... It wasn't sexual in nature? No. All right. How do, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, there was no sexual gratification. They didn't pull these pants down. The other three victims, they weren't penetrated, and it was the same same ritual. Do you know what uh, state law, how it defines sexual penetration? Yes, I do, yes. And what is that definition? Well, the definition is uh, penetration of the orifices of the body by penis or, or an animated object, yeah. I mean, I can't quote it, which I'm however sure you slight, can. You would call that yes. in there? However slight. And that nowhere in that definition is sexual gratification mentioned? It's not a component of rape, it is for sexual battery, but they weren't trying. To, to, as soon as it penetrated his pants, they stopped. Their intent, and this is what they said too, we never meant for this to happen, we didn't mean for this, and I think they were being truthful when they said that. This just shouldn't happen on one night though, right? The other three players were on previous nights. Uh, one of them was like a couple of days before. Um, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but yes, I mean, to answer the short answer is yes. One of them had been uh, hazed Short like this. Yes. One of them had been hazed like this a couple, three days prior, and the other two had. Um, I got conflicting stories, but the other two uh, finally settled that it was the day before Mon was hurt. So, and you've charged one count of aggravated rape. I've count. I've. Um, well, they said that it didn't go up inside of him. If that's what you're where you're going with this. I didn't. I didn't decide where I'm going with this yet. That's my question to you. 
Yes, yes, I've counted each of the three suspects were charged with one count each of aggravated rape and aggravated assault. Yes, sir. The other three all talked about the pool cue in the same manner except they weren't hurt. Well, they said it didn't go up inside of them. It didn't penetrate their clothing and go up inside of them. I mean, initially, only one of the other two wanted to press charges. Okay. But that doesn't mean, what, what does that matter? Well, you got to have a, a victim if you go to court. Okay, but you've never been involved. If they're, not, if they're not a compliant victim, how are you going to charge and go to court if you don't have a victim there? Have you ever charged somebody with a crime and not necessarily had a victim speaking up loudly about wanting to prosecute? you got to have a victim. So what's yes or no to that question? No. I mean, no. All right. So if the one that injured the child is a rape, why is it not a rape in the other three instances? If well, sexual gratification is not required. It didn't go up inside of them. I wasn't told that it penetrated them. You recall one of them talked about the main victim talking about the night before a victim was violated in the same manner and screamed throughout the cabin. Do you remember that? He said that he heard him yelling. Uh, he heard him yelling inside the cabin. Okay. Uh, yeah. Inside. He said he heard him outside the door. He said they had shut the door. How many rape cases have you investigated prior to this? Numerous. What's that mean? I don't know. I didn't got a count. You can call the court, I guess, and find out. I don't know, I sir. I do that later, but I was wondering, you know, if you if you have an idea. No, I don't. I've can quite a few. You, I've got three investigations going right now. Uh, so it's your opinion to charge somebody with rape, injury has to occur? No, injury doesn't have to occur, but, um, you know, you have to have components of rape. Okay. And a pool cue into someone's rectum, uh, that would be a... That would fit with the definition of sexual penetration. That's what I charged, sir. The pool stick went into that young I man's rectum. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And so if that's good for one, and they were all, as you mentioned a moment ago, treated in a similar fashion but for the injuries, that would be four rapes, not one. Sir, yes I worked. No? no, that is not correct. That's what they didn't go in their rectum. Did okay. Did you not say a moment ago that they were all treated in a similar fashion? Except for injuries. You're trying to twist what I said, sir. No, That's I'm, not I'm what I'm saying. That That's what not said? what I'm you saying, sir. Let the witness answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Wasn't your witness is doing fine. Go ahead, Mr. Pinson. Did you not mention a moment ago in direct examination that all four of the individuals were treated in a similar fashion but for the injury to the main victim? They were treated in the same fashion, but it didn't bust through their clothing and go up inside their rectum. They were treated in the same fashion, right? That's yes. Your words. That's an acid answer. Yes. Times. I mean, we're just trying to get to the truth. Remember, no, it didn't. We have been trying to get to the truth. It and didn't as, go up into his rectum. He's testified to that. These other gentlemen's rectums. He's testified. Three well, times. he's testified around it. No, overruled. I think. I think he's done with that. Uh, when you take took pictures of the, what we I guess with the cabin of the crime scene, did you do on that particular day, the twenty third? Yes, I, I didn't take um, complete pictures. I took pictures of the area where it occurred, the bedroom, and then the pool area. Did you observe? At the uh, entrance. Was there any blood? Let's talk about the main victim and where he was injured. Was there any blood in that area? No. All right. Has there been any measures to clean up that area? I found out later that uh, the coach's wife had cleaned up some blood that was in the bathroom from after where he had went in and bled. All right. Where were the main victims' clothes found, sir? Where were they found? Yes. They were in a bag in the trash can. Okay. Who put those there? I understood that the coach's wife did. Okay. Was that information offered to you, or you just found it part of your investigation? I found it just part of my investigation. So nobody told you his clothes were thrown away? Uh, let me think about that a minute. I asked Patrol where his clothes was. And I told him to make sure that they had his clothing, you know, and they, when I asked them about it, they couldn't find it. And they went and got, that's right, they went and got Miss Montgomery and, and she told me that she had put them in the trash. Now, I initially thought she bagged them up and put them in the trash, but later on, I found out that the victim himself had bagged up his clothing. It was wet and it had a little bit of fecal matter on the underwear and it was wet and smelly. So I think he was embarrassed blood. and he bagged it up. Blood. I didn't see no blood, sir, no. Now there may be some and I didn't see it by the naked eye, but I didn't see no blood, no. All right. And so, uh, and you mentioned that there were two pool sticks that were used. Well, there was one pool stick that was used. I was given two, I took them both in evidence. 
and uh, I wrapped them. I wrapped them at the scene and took them to the station. And um, I, that was what made me open up the evidence later on and look, because when I looked at them, the tips were still on there. And you know, a long time ago, they used to put felt on the end of the tips, but now it's kind of like a hard plastic. And I looked and I thought, you know, this ain't broke off. So um, it was several days later, I went back to the cabin and, uh, and I thought, I told them to get me all the pool sticks. And I looked around, that's all they saw, and they had two layout patrols, what I'm talking about. So I went back up there, and they were two more sticks, but they too had very warped tips on them. So that's what got me to open up the canister and look and see that it wasn't a pool stick at all, but it was a piece of clothing from the victim's sweatpants. Does that somehow minimize what he went through? I don't think so, but I mean, it's, it's a, you know, the facts is, like we're saying, the truth, it's not the tip of a pool stick, it's a piece of his clothing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you.